Gear Patrol calls their new dive watch the best sub $500 dive watch. Full stop. Men's Health rated them as the most stylish solar watch in the game. Who are we talking about? It's movement. They're leveling up your gift giving with the sleekest watches you can buy and the biggest deals of the season. From their innovative ceramic materials to sexy automatic divers, from ultra thin dress watches to solar powered statement pieces and everything in between, movement is making sure you're the good gifter this year for your family, your friends, or for yourself. And now you can take advantage of 30 to 50% off Movement's California clean watches, jewelry, and accessories to get them a gift they'll never forget. With fast free shipping and returns and amazing bang for your buck, Movement makes for a relaxed shopping experience. And with one-size-fits-all watches, it's an easy, elegant gifting experience too. Shop 30 to 50% off now at MVMT.com. That's MVMT.com. Bullet Bourbon Barbecue. It's new at Buffalo Wild Wings. A rich and smoky barbecue sauce infused with Bullet Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Bullet Bourbon Barbecue Sauce. It's now available for limited time only and only at Buffalo Wild Wings. This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 70, for broadcast on the 21st of June, 2021. Happy Solstice. Coming up on Space Time. An update on those U.S. Navy Tic Tac UFOs, studying the atmosphere of a brown dwarf, and China's new space station gets its first crew. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Last year, the U.S. Department of Defense formally released three Navy videos showing encounters between U.S. Navy fighter jets in a series of what they term unexplained aerial phenomena, what most people call UFOs. Since then, more similar vision has been made public by crew aboard two U.S. Navy warships. The Pentagon has offered no explanation as to what these objects are, other than to say there's no evidence that these unexplained aerial phenomena are alien spacecraft and that they're not secret American military aircraft, which of course destroys our original suggestion that they're probably a new generation of advanced autonomous military drones. Although the Navy haven't publicly ruled out some advanced new Russian or Chinese technology, but there are probably good tactical political reasons for that. The Director of National Intelligence has put together a full congressional report on the issue, covering decades of both publicly available and classified military files. An unclassified version of this report is expected to be released to the public in the next week or so. The three original videos, simply known as Gimbal, Fleur 1 and GoFast, were taken by Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward-Looking Infrared Camera Wing Pods, mounted on carrier-based FA-18 Super Hornet fighter jets. Yeah. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the SA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. That's not an LNS, though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing, it's rotating. Tickle 6 1 tank of small jet on it. Oh, got it! Roger. Uh, there's a oh, oh, shooting. What the fuck is that? Did you box moving target? No, I took an auto track. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow. The 2004 gimbal footage involved the sighting of an object described by the pilots as some sort of new drone. The second video, known simply as Flow 1, was recorded in November 2004. It involved an encounter between a pair of hornets from the USS Nimitz off the coast of San Diego and shows an oblong-shaped object which appears to accelerate out of view from sensors at very high speed. That story apparently began with a Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser USS Princeton detecting a series of intermittent radar tracks. A few days later, the Princeton reported 5 to 10 similar radar tracers and Nimitz ordered a pair of FA-18s to check it out. According to the report, the object first appeared to drop from around 80,000 feet down to a hover just 50 feet above the ocean, causing the water to appear to boil and then rapidly climbing again to 12,000 feet before accelerating away at supersonic speeds. 
The pilots described the object as bright white and shaped like a tic-tac, about 14 metres long with no wings, no exhaust and no discernible propulsion system. A short time later, the Princeton told the FA-18s the radar track had now been detected 100 kilometres away, but it disappeared long before the Hornets could reach that location. The third video, known as Go Fast, shows an incident that occurred off the east coast of the United States in 2015 involving Hornets off the USS Theodore Roosevelt. The UFO was described as having no distinct wings, no distinct tail, no distinct exhaust plume and looking like a sphere encasing a cube. According to the pilots, the object was described as showing up at 30,000 feet as well as at sea level and being able to accelerate, slow down and hit hypersonic speeds with manoeuvres far beyond the physical limits of a human crew. The consensus among the pilots, apparently, was that these UFOs were some new kind of drones. Science skeptic investigator Mick West from Metabunk.org has taken an in-depth analysis of these videos, breaking down and reverse engineering the original vision. And he was able to include something we couldn't, the original technical metadata, such as the speed and altitude of the aircraft carrying the camera, the heading of the target relative to the aircraft, the slant angle up or down of the target relative to the aircraft, and the radar range of the target object from the aircraft. This additional data allowed West to painstakingly calculate the real movements of the target rather than just the apparent movements relative to the camera as seen by the pilots. Speaking to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe team and using the Go Fast video as his example, West was able to paint a very different picture to that which the pilots were seeing and importantly, it all fits together rather nicely. The unidentified aerial phenomenon appeared to be moving really fast just above the ocean surface. But once you include the information contained in the metadata, the heading of the camera aircraft, the range to the target, and the slant angle down from the camera to the target, you can work out the true altitude of the target to be about halfway between sea level and the aircraft. The aircraft was flying at 25,000 feet, which means the target was actually at around 12,500 feet. The Tic Tac's true speed could be determined using the angle and range of the target at the start of the video and again at the end of the video, as well as the bank angle and velocity of the aircraft carrying the camera. Now crunching those numbers and using a bit of basic high school trigonometry, West was able to determine that the object really wasn't flying supersonically at all, but was actually only moving at about 40 knots, give or take 20 knots. So basically that's wind speed. Infrared cameras lack high resolution at the best of times, so things are going to look a little bit out of focus, a little bit fuzzy. So the Tic Tac was really more ball-shaped rather than lozenge-shaped. Another important point is that the cameras aboard the FA-18 were in what's known as black-hot mode. Under those conditions, cold objects would look white, and of course the Tic Tac looked white, so it must have been around ambient air temperature. Another important factor was that it provided a really strong radar lock, It was something that wanted to be seen, which is totally unlike anything you'd expect from some sort of advanced stealthy aircraft. Occam's razor tells us entities should not be multiplied without necessity, but it's best if somewhat inaccurately paraphrased as meaning the simplest explanation is usually correct. So if we put all this together, what you really end up with is a small round object without wings, without any control surfaces or visible propulsion system, blowing around in the wind and providing a really strong radar lock. And that suggests the most likely answer isn't some advanced flying saucer from another world, or even the secret advanced spy drone that we thought it could have been. No, the most likely answer is a weather balloon. Then in April this year, more footage emerged, this time showing what appears to be an unidentified triangular object in the sky taken by Navy personnel aboard the Ali Burke-class Aegis destroyer USS Russell in 2019. Science skeptic investigator Mick West from Metabunk.org says the image was nothing more than an optical effect called a buka, which can make an out-of-focus light source appear triangular or pyramid-like in shape, due to the shape of the aperture on some lenses. Then last month, the Pentagon confirmed a second video had been recorded by naval personnel, which is now under review by the Unexplained Aerial Phenomena Task Force. The video, apparently recorded on July 15, 2019, aboard the Independence-class littoral combat ship USS Omaha, shows a spherical object flying over the ocean as seen through an infrared camera at night, 
moving rapidly across the screen before suddenly stopping and then easing down into the water. Jonathan Nally is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. I think what they they call them these days is an unexplained aerial phenomenon, a UAP. That's it. Yes. Uh, they really should call it an unexplained apparent aerial phenomenon, UAAP, because it wasn't really in the air. Now that now this this footage that's shown of this sort of spherical looking thing buzzing along, not far apparently not far above the surface of the water, and then um, diving into the water. Yeah, massive high G's um, as it turns, things like this. And see if you've got an object that you don't recognise, okay, you can see what sort of shape it is, but you, you've never seen this object before, and it's not flying between you and the nearest building or you and then the tree down the road or whatever, it's at a distance and, and it's not flying between you and anything else, then you can't tell how big it is or how far away it is or how fast it's flying. You can only do that with something that you really recognize. So if you see, if you're standing next to the runway when a jumbo jet takes off, right, it's going to go past you and it's going to seem really, really fast. And you know that jumbo jets are big, so you can, you can judge the whole thing. And when you see a jumbo jet flying up high, high in the sky in the distance over there, it seems to be going really, really slowly. But you know that it's going three or four times faster than it was when it was taking off the runway that you were standing beside. So you can judge because you know what a jumbo jet's size is, you know what it looks like, and you know what sort of speeds it does. But if you've got an object that you've never seen before and, and you can't tell its scale or how big it is, then you can't tell how far away it is. Therefore, you can't really tell what speed it's doing. Now, this footage that they've got now, I don't know whether they had radar on it or something else or whether they were able to um, triangulate and uh, get some sort of distance on it, but it could have been a, a little thing very close or a big thing a long way away. So these are the sort of things you've got to, got to think of. So um, pulling Gs means you're going very high speed, but if it was something small that's very close to you, well, it wouldn't have had to pull so many Gs to, to do its turn. There are a lot of artefacts associated with the equipment taking the image as well with the gimbal. There are a lot of yeah, and look, other and look, aspects sort of- associated with this. Also, even just the type of uh, if it's a radar they're using, what radar band are they on? Is it an S band or, or what? This would make the blurry object it's a blurry object to start with. That's why it's described as a tic-tac because they, you yeah. can't really see what it is. Is it so far away? Yeah, and every measurement you make has inaccuracy so um, uh, you can only do certain things to a certain precision. So anyway, we're sort of guessing because we don't really know the details of the uh, the systems they were using and, and those sort of camera systems that are used by um, ships and aircraft and whatever, they're designed for a certain purpose. They're designed to spot other aircraft or other ships so they're optimised for things travelling at certain speeds and being at certain distances so when uh, when things are not sort of behaving the way you might expect them to then the, the, the gear might not be the best gear to try and observe that with. Yeah but these but, are but none pilots of- who often see these things, these are Navy pilots, sorry, naval aviators I think yeah, that's what they now, call yeah. them on Top Gun and you'd think they'd be trained observers but uh, they're often not. Look they are not and um, this sort of thing has come up time and time again over the years and it's not just to do with UFOs or anything else, you, you can go and look up any number of court cases where people who you think would be you know, really good observers of stuff just aren't, like police officers and firefighters and all sorts of people and pilots and all sorts of people you think, uh, they must be highly trained people and know what they're looking at. If you unexpectedly see something, then it doesn't matter who you are, then there's a good chance you're not going to remember it correctly. If you can anticipate that things happening, then you can be ready and prepared, but otherwise not. So speaking of pilots, I do recall at least one report from a long time ago of commercial passenger planes flying over one of the oceans and uh, and a big bright meteor came in through the atmosphere and to the pilot this huge fast flash of light looked like it was coming straight for them so they took evasive action you know they flung the plane around in the sky to get away from this meteor whereas in reality it's 100 200 kilometers away or something it's nowhere near them if you see a meteor flash then you can be assured that it's nowhere near it's uh, because it's still still very very high up in the sky when it's when it's producing the the flash of light uh, and only gets down into the lower atmosphere much later so um yeah it's easy to be fooled and i also recall another instance if i can re- remember it correctly i think it was a american military helicopter flying might have been the Gulf of Mexico years yes, ago, and yes. they reported seeing or and, and had footage on their sort of night vision gear, these cluster of lights in the sky ahead of them, and it just they didn't show on radar, and no one knew what they were, and no other aircraft could tell what they were. When they looked at the footage later and analysed that um, the, the camera was actually pointing downwards a bit, and what they were seeing were oil rigs on the surface of the ocean. These things were not up in the sky at all, so it's easy to be a bit disorientated. And, I mean, I also recall reading about a woman 
driving along in her car and ending up racing to the nearest police station in an absolute panic, saying that she was being chased by a UFO. She wasn't. All she saw was the planet Venus. Now, you know when you're driving down a country road somewhere and, and you've got a beautiful line of poplar trees or something along the side and you get that sort of strobing effect mm-hmm. of a library of the moon or the sun? Well, the, the planet Venus was off to one side and it's so big and bright and it just seems to be following you, particularly when you get this sort of strobing effect. And it really spooked this poor woman and she thought this big bright light was following her, whereas in reality it just simply wasn't. So there are any number of ways to get fooled by things in the night sky if you're not accustomed to to uh, looking at the night sky. Now, I've been looking at the night sky for decades and I've never seen anything I could not explain. They just haven't. And people have told me their tales of things they couldn't explain and I've always been able to explain what they were. So um, this whole Tic Tac thing and the um, yeah, these so-called UFOs that the military are picking up. It's interesting, isn't it? If aliens were coming all the way here from some other planet, you'd think that they'd be pretty advanced and wouldn't really be bothered by our military technology. You would think that they'd probably have pretty good military technology themselves. They would have good Klingon cloaking devices, wouldn't they? They'd have cloaking devices. <laughs> they'd have all sorts of stuff we can't even imagine. Or maybe Romulan cloaking devices. These, whatever they are that, that are being apparently seen, are buzzing around American aircraft carrier <laughs> battle routes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in various parts of the world indicates that if they are real and someone's controlling them, someone who's interested in the American military, and who would that be? That's the other angle, isn't it? You know, Are these drones yeah. operated by the Russians or Chinese? Well, I hate we, to we, say we, this, I don't think the Russians and Chinese have technology that's that advanced. Look over here, there's a UFO. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. The Pentagon's also confirmed images of other objects described as sphere, acorn and metallic blimp. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. So uh, the the reason I was going to raise this topic today is because there's a very interesting, really interesting article on the conversation. Uh, UFOs, how to calculate the odds that an alien spaceship has been spotted. And it's by a scientist at the University of Oxford. And he has applied something that in astronomy we use a lot. It's uh, really the almost the cornerstone of some of the deductions that we make about the universe. And it's called Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics actually is kind of slightly different from normal statistics because you start off with something called a prior, which is an assumption that something might be the case. I don't want to go into the details, obviously, because it's very mathematical. And um, between you and me, Andrew, I'm not sure that I understand it either. But anyway, this scientist uses Bayesian statistics to come up with more or less what I've been thinking as well, which is that... Yes, there is clearly something going on. Could be as yet un, uh, unadvertised technology. The, there is something going on, and uh, the idea of a, a UFO, an un, uh, unidentified flying object, we all associate that with the idea of alien technology, um, you know, extraterrestrial technology. But actually, the expression itself doesn't demand that. An unidentified flying object is just that, an unidentified flying object. And when you apply yeah. this sort of statistical analysis, you you get to the conclusion that it could be one of many, many things. In fact, the author of this article actually, um, I think he was being a little bit tongue in cheek, but he said these things in the sky could equally well be fairies, intrusions from the fifth dimension, swamp gas, foreign drones, sapient octopuses or anything else. And that's equally probable as it being, <laughs> is it being alien visitation. There are a few other things. And there are some things that you would have thought might have been ruled out, but might behave the way that uh, that some of these objects have done. One, I spoke to one of the pundits uh, a few days ago, uh, somebody um, who's kind of close to the action on uh, uh, on uh, Space Nuts. Uh, it, it, and as I won't give his name, <laughs> but um, I thought this was a very good guess at what might be going on here. Weather balloons. Weather balloons get everywhere. And because they can move yeah. with the jet stream, they can move extremely quickly. And of course, a 500G turn means is, is absolutely no problem to a weather balloon. This These things could be anything. And it's... Uh, mm. You know, the Bayesian analysis that this um, scientist at Oxford University uh, went through came out with a one in one billion probability that this was a result of extraterrestrial technology. And part of that comes about because like 
me and many other scientists, we are very uncomfortable with the idea of there being much other than rudimentary, perhaps, you know, single-celled organisms out there in space, just because of this huge jump that you need in thermodynamics to get from a single-celled organism to a multi-celled organism. Now, of course, because there are 10th of power 23 planets in the, at least in the universe you can never rule it out but the thing that's you know that what one of the other things that pushes down the the statistics as far as alien visitations is concerned is just the enormous distances between stars and galaxies and this all mm. plays also into the direct the drake equation and um when you put the modern numbers into the drake equation you get very very low probabilities of there being species like ourselves within our own galaxy if not uh within a a much broader swathe of the universe. So I think, like you, Andrew, that eventually we'll find out what these things are, but they are not necessarily anything to do with extraterrestrial civilizations. No, most likely not. And uh, yeah, there's there's nothing to suggest that it's one single uh, thing. It could be a multitude of um, phenomena. Uh, it could just be a trick of the light. It could be... Swamp gas, as, as they suggested, <laughs> it, it it could be technology. It it yeah. could be any number of things. It um, it could be ball lightning on occasion. You just don't know. Yeah. Um, and until we've got conclusive evidence, then we just keep looking. One of the things uh, that um, this author of the conversation article, and I might tell you his name, he's Anders Sandberg, and he's at uh, Oxford Martin School in the University of Oxford. One of the things that he, a comment that he makes is that science did not believe in meteorites until trustworthy multiple witnesses brought in rocks found to be of unknown minerals and our understanding of the solar system allowed for asteroids. So it's interesting to look at history as well when you think about these things as well as Bayesian statistics and maybe you know in a few years time mm. we'll all be chuckling at the way we were deluded into thinking this was something you know extraterrestrial. Yeah yeah very likely uh, but isn't it so human of us to try and attach the unknown to something that we can understand or, or want to believe? And, uh, you know, that's, that's been documented throughout human history. So, uh, if, you know, we, we think we're so advanced and so very clever today, but uh, I think there are times where we demonstrate we are still, you know, quite naive, I think would be the nicest way to put it. <laughs> It's great fun as well for us uh, to, to speculate on what it might be, as long as you don't take it too seriously. <laughs> That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And we'll have more on this story later on when we're joined by Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new study of failed stars known as brown dwarfs suggests they have a layer cake atmosphere. And China's new space station gets its first crew. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. Gear Patrol calls their new dive watch the best sub $500 dive watch. Full stop. Men's Health rated them as the most stylish solar watch in the game. Who are we talking about? It's movement. They're leveling up your gift giving with the sleekest watches you can buy and the biggest deals of the season. From their innovative ceramic materials to sexy automatic divers, from ultra thin dress watches to solar powered statement pieces and everything in between, movement is making sure you're the good gifter this year for your family, your friends, or for yourself. And now you can take advantage of 30 to 50% off Movement's California clean watches, jewelry, and accessories to get them a gift they'll never forget. With fast free shipping and returns and amazing bang for your buck, Movement makes for a relaxed shopping experience. And with one-size-fits-all watches, it's an easy, elegant gifting experience too. Shop 30 to 50% off now at MVMT.com. That's MVMT.com. A new study of failed stars known as brown dwarves suggests they have a layer cake-like atmospheric structure. Brown dwarves are objects which don't have enough mass to sustain the core hydrogen fusion process which makes stars like our sun shine. However, some brown dwarves do fuse deuterium or lithium under certain conditions. 
While many brown dwarves are born as brown dwarves, others actually start their lives as spectrotype M red dwarf stars, which have turned into brown dwarves after losing enough mass through their evolution to cease core hydrogen fusion, thereby turning them from red dwarves into brown dwarves. Brown dwarves fit into a category between the largest planets, which have about 12 to 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectrotype M red dwarf stars which have about 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or about 0.08 solar masses. Astronomers decided to study a very young and therefore extremely bright rogue brown dwarf which hadn't cooled off yet, known as 2 mass J2208136326213215. which is located some 115 light years away and isn't part of any known star system. This brown dwarf is very similar in appearance to a nearby giant exoplanet known as Beta Pictoris b, discovered in 2008 in near-infrared images taken by the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in Chile. The exoplanet has about 13 times the mass and 1.46 times the radius of Jupiter and was discovered in the young debris disk A-type main sequence star Beta Pictoris, located some 63 light years away. Astronomers have analysed the composition of some of these so-called super-Jupiters, but it's been difficult to analyse their atmospheres in detail, because these gas giants get lost in the glare of their parent stars. Because current technology won't allow astronomers to undertake a detailed analysis of the atmosphere of Beta Pictoris b, the authors decided instead to study the brown dwarf's atmosphere as a proxy, in order to get an idea of what the exoplanet's clouds might look like at different altitudes in its atmosphere. Both brown dwarves and super-Jupiters have similar temperatures and are extremely massive with complex and varied atmospheres. And both this brown dwarf and Beta Pictoris b are young, both are similar in mass, and both radiate heat strongly in the near-infrared. They're also both members of the same flock of stars and substellar objects known as the Beta Pictoris moving group, which shares the same origin and a common motion through space. The group, which is about 33 million years old, is the closest grouping of young stars to Earth. Elena Manjavakis from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, led a team of astronomers using the Multi-Object Spectrograph for Infrared Exploration, or MOSFIRE, on the giant 10-metre Keck telescope in Hawaii to undertake a series of observations of the brown dwarf. She says the brown dwarf appeared to glow from the inside out, just like a carved Halloween pumpkin, with energy escaping from its hot interior. The observations also showed it had a mottled atmosphere, with a scattered layer cake-like cloud structure and mysterious dark spots, similar to Jupiter's giant anticyclone, the Great Red Spot. MOSFIRE collected the spectral fingerprints of various chemical elements contained in the clouds and how they changed with time. The authors found the brown dwarf has a temperature of around 1,527 degrees Celsius. Because it's still very young, it's spinning incredibly fast, completing a full revolution every three and a half hours. That compares to Jupiter's 10-hour rotational period. Because of this, the clouds in this brown dwarf were whipping around, creating a dynamic, turbulent atmosphere. MOSFIRE was able to gaze at the brown dwarf for two and a half hours, watching how the light filtered up through the atmosphere from its hot interior, brightening and dimming over time. Bright spots indicated regions where the astronomers could peer deeper into the atmosphere, areas where it's hotter. Its spectrum revealed clouds of hot sand grains and other exotic elements. Potassium iodide traces were found in the brown dwarf's upper atmosphere, which also includes magnesium silicate clouds at altitudes of 386 kilometres. Deeper down in the atmosphere, at around 331 kilometres, the authors found a layer of sodium iodide also with magnesium silicate clouds. The deepest layer they could see consists of aluminum oxide clouds at around 269 kilometres. Overall, the authors were able to see the atmosphere's total depth down to 781 kilometres. A stunning achievement. This is Space Time. Still to come, China's new space station gets its first crew. And later in the science report, Novavax completes phase 3 trials of its new COVID-19 vaccine with stunning results. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
China's new Tiangong or Heavenly Palace space station has its first tenants. A team of three Taikonauts have spent the next 90 days setting up the orbiting outpost. The crew were launched aboard a Long March 2F rocket from the Zhukuang Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Gobi Desert on what was Beijing's first manned space flight in more than five years. The three-month mission will also be China's longest ever manned space flight. The Shenzhou-12 capsule successfully docked with the space station's Tianhe, or Heavenly Harmony core module, six hours after launch. The bus-sized space station module was placed into orbit on April the 29th. The mission drew intense international criticism last month after the rocket which carried the Tianhe module into orbit fell back to Earth in an uncontrolled re-entry, which eventually crashed into the Indian Ocean near the Maldives on May the 9th. The Tianzhou 2 cargo ship, loaded with fuel, food and equipment, successfully docked to the space station on May 29th. The newly arrived crew will now configure the 16.6 metre long, 4.2 metre diameter core module from its initial launch configuration into what will be its orbital cruise configuration. They'll then begin testing equipment, unloading supplies from the recently arrived cargo ship and begin preparing the orbital outpost for the arrival of two more modules next year. The crew will also need to undertake at least two spacewalks during their stay on station, testing newly developed spacesuits, replacing the Russian-based spacesuits they've previously used. Most of Beijing's space technology is Russian-based, much of it bought off the shelf from Moscow. The successful man launch represents a huge propaganda opportunity for China as Beijing prepares to mark the 100th anniversary of the ruling Chinese Communist Party on July the 1st. China's planning at least 10 more missions to the space station, including three more manned flights, the delivery of two more modules, and five more supply missions loaded with equipment such as solar arrays, in order to get the 70-ton space station fully operational over the next two years. Beijing is also planning to build a separate lunar space station, either on the lunar surface or in lunar orbit, with the Russians. As for China's new Earth-orbiting space station, it's expected to remain operational for at least 10 years. This is Space Time. If your child is considering something as big as joining the military, you can bet they're taking the time to do some research. You can too, by visiting todaysmilitary.com. Because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. Shop the Plato's Closet Black Friday event in North Charleston and West Ashley and let the deals begin. You know Plato's Closet always has a huge selection of trendy recycled styles at amazing prices, but Black Friday deals are different. They're better. We've been holding back some of our best inventory and you won't want to miss our Black Friday event. Save on gently used styles from Patagonia, Lululemon, Lily Pulitzer, and hundreds of popular brands. Plato's Closet is ready to let the Black Friday deals begin. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Novavax have finally completed phase 3 trials of their new COVID-19 vaccine, finding it to be 90.4% effective against symptomatic COVID-19 and 100% effective against moderate and severe disease. A report in the journal Science says the new vaccine uses a SARS-CoV-2 protein. That's different technology from the COVID-19 vaccines authorised so far. Most COVID-19 vaccines deliver genetic material that directs the recipient's cells to produce SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which then trains the immune system to respond to the virus. The Novavax vaccine instead delivers the spike protein itself, together with an immune-boosting adjuvant. Similar protein technology has been used for decades in vaccines against diseases such as hepatitis B. The World Health Organization now estimates more than 8 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with almost 4 million confirmed fatalities and almost 180 million people infected since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. A new study warns that cannabis use during teen years can alter brain development. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on a study of 1,598 brain scans from 799 kids who were aged 14 at the time of their first scan and who were then followed up five years later for a second brain scan. 
The authors found that cannabis use during adolescence was associated with abnormal brain development, leading to thinner cortices, that's the brain's outermost layers, which are made up mostly of grey matter, in the prefrontal regions of the brain. And the more cannabis teens used, the thinner their cortices were, suggesting it's the cannabis which was causing the changes seen. The areas in question are thought to be rich in cannabinoid receptors, which probably explains why cannabis appears to have affected their development. A microscopic multicellular organism called a bedilloid rotifer has been returned to life after being frozen in solid ice in the Siberian Arctic for some 24,000 years. A report in the journal Current Biology claims radiocarbon dating has placed the specimen at between 23,960 and 24,485 years old. Once thawed, the organism was able to successfully reproduce through a clonal process known as parthenogenesis. The observations suggest that these microbes have some mechanism which shields their cells and organs from harm at exceedingly low temperatures. Of course, it's not the first time scientists have done this. They've previously revived nematodes from 30,000-year-old Siberian permafrost, and whole campion plants have been regenerated from seed tissue preserved in relic 32,000-year-old permafrost. Scientists have created a quantum microscope which can reveal biological structures that would otherwise be impossible to see. A report in the journal Nature claims the new microscope is powered by the science of quantum entanglement, paving the way for applications extending into areas ranging from navigation through to medical imaging. The best current light microscopes use bright lasers, billions of times brighter than the sun. The problem is they damage fragile biological systems like human cells. Quantum entanglement provides 35% improved clarity without destroying the cell, thereby allowing scientists to see minute biological structures that would otherwise be invisible. Earlier in the show, we looked at the recent spate of US Navy UFO reports and the often simple down-to-earth explanations for what was really seen. But why would the US Navy encourage speculation like this in the first place? Is it simply a case of making you look at the shiny thing over there so you don't look at what's over here? Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says it's worth pondering. UFO reports come and go. They Sometimes they have a lot of them and other times they sort of fade away. And even the UFO investigation groups they will say the same thing. There hasn't been a great year for UFO reports. Lately, of course, we've had these videos that have come out issued by the Pentagon or by the American Navy or Air Force or whatever they are. And that has created a lot of interest. It's very concerning that a group like the Pentagon would release these things and su- suggesting that, oh, we don't know what they are. These are mysterious sort of unidentified flying objects or un- unidentified aerial phenomena or flying sources or whatever you'd like to call them. Because the Pentagon to release that information in such an environment is pretty weird. They don't do that normally. Don't normally release the videos, or sometimes they do, and there's no great problem in releasing those videos. But they might come up with a better explanation than that because they actually have been, as you've been discussing on the program, quite readily explained in many cases and quite mundane explanations. Well, the Pentagon doesn't want everybody to know the exact capabilities of their forward-looking infrared systems. So that's something that they don't want the world to know about. Unfortunately, it's out now because once you've got that sort of data, you can pretty well back engineer it anyway because it lets you know how you can, if you're an enemy actor, how you can sort of combat that. The interesting thing is that the ones they're hiding the information from would be the public. I would dare say that most of the ones they need to hide it from, which is other nations, etc., either already know about what the Americans are doing or are developing in themselves. And so you're trying to think, who are you preventing from learning about this thing? The general public are not going to be able to build the technology that they're talking about, right? They probably have trouble understanding what the technology is, which helps the UFO belief. The technology is being built by Raytheon, and Raytheon really don't want their competitors to know about it. Maybe I should Yeah, they, yes, but industrial way. espionage happens a lot, and you know, all sorts of things, and they probably know roughly the general areas they're working in, but I know. It, but it, it, it's a climate, and whether the Pentagon or whatever is seriously sort of looking at technologies they don't want to reveal, or as in the case of some of these things, there were very mundane explanations for some of the videos that were put out which had nothing to do with secret technologies. One was to do with the iris of cameras and the way cameras work. 
ordinary cameras, which can be replicated easily. The video of the pyramid, pyramid-shaped object, was because of the shape of the lens of the camera and the iris of the camera. When it closes in, some of these irises of particular cameras close things in a triangular format. Irises are made up of different panels which close at the same time in a spiral pattern, and these ones sort of was closing in the triangular pattern, and that was creating the appearance when you defocus from a particular light that it was looking triangular. And that's something that, that was sort of yeah, revealed pretty quickly. And for the Pentagon to say, we don't know what these things are, is perhaps it is false information and false leads, but it was feeding the UFO people and uh, feeding people who can actually say quite clearly what they are. Unfortunately, the explanations don't uh, carry as quickly as the UFO fear tactics and theories. But well, the Pentagon getting involved in that sort of thing is just, uh, they should not get involved in that sort of thing. Oh, they they've just... done it so well for so long. Do you want to go back to 1947 and Project Mogul and Roswell? And yeah, if, if the Pentagon or wanted to retrieve its balloons and uh, didn't want anyone to know about them, well, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the well, they didn't got really out. care about the balloons. It was only balsa wood and wax paper and a bit of rubber. They didn't care about the balloons. The balloons weren't top secret. It was what they were being used for to yeah, eavesdrop yeah. on Soviet Union nuclear tests. That was the secret and well, how they were that, able to that, work that, that out. Of course, that's the climate in which conspiracy theories have some sort of justification because organisations and government organisations do keep secrets or try to keep secrets. They're not always very good at it, but they do try and keep secrets, especially military organisations. And as you say, private companies, sort of trying to keep their intellectual property secret. That does happen and they do give false leads, etc. It's unfortunate that in this case, if, if that is the situation or if it's just the Pentagon having fun, it's encouraged a lot of UFO believers. And virtually every famous UFO case has been debunked at some time or another. But that's the debunking doesn't necessarily go very far compared to the claimants. So I've got books I'm staring at right now. Von Daniken. You remember the, yeah, the Von Daniken theories? Oh, I love ex- Chariots of the Gods when I was a kid. I believed that <laughs> To the letter, but I was about eight at the time. Yes, well, same here. I mean, I loved it too. Uh, the ancient astronauts theory and that sort of stuff. He's published a gazillion number of books. He made a lot of money out of it. But I've also got a whole handful of books debunking what he said, and they probably sold in the hundreds rather than the millions, which is what Von Daniken did. That's part of the problem. The truth... The actual truth does not sell as well as the as the myth, yeah, and that people, might be the case. That's always the case with a lot of UFO yeah, sightings. Yeah, people like to dream. They love to dream. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. I mean, yeah, from a sceptical point of view, it's probably a lot of the harmless stuff. Well, if you, know, you were told UFOs, that this could be a uh, flying saucer from another world, or it's a weather balloon and maybe a new type of drone. Or it's Venus. Would, or it's <laughs> Venus. Which would you want to believe? Which you want to believe, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, fantasy is fun. Did you watch the Spotlight program on UFOs a couple of weeks back? I, I didn't see that, I must admit, um, but I have you some people who nothing. did see it. That, well, that's what I'm told, and, and someone gave me a report back of the entire history of UFO documentaries made by the same fellow, and they say they're just repeating and regurgitating the same thing over and over again, which has been debunked, and they're just adding one new little thing to a compilation that is just nothing new. Well, the interesting thing new. I found was that the United States tested stealth technology in the Australian outback for a while there. I didn't think they did that, and if that bit's true, that's that's fascinating. It is fascinating. No, I'm not surprised. The first question every president asks is, where do you keep the alien bodies? Tell me about this. Yeah, it doesn't get much than that, actually. The re- reports that Obama asked, I dare say Trump asked the same thing, and no doubt Biden and every other president back to about the 1950s have probably asked the same thing, where do you keep the bodies of the aliens and where's the technology and why are we leading the world, etc. I think it's done as a joke. <laughs> I don't know if they were seriously, well, not all the presidents would seriously read that low level of intelligence to, to take it very seriously. But to me, it, yeah, it's a fair enough question to ask. And then go on to the serious issues and what are we doing about you know, foreign relations, etc., rather than uh, extraterrestrial relations. It's a fun thing. Don't take it too seriously, Stuart. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. 
or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Gear Patrol calls their new dive watch the best sub $500 dive watch. Full stop. Men's Health rated them as the most stylish solar watch in the game. Who are we talking about? It's movement. They're leveling up your gift giving with the sleekest watches you can buy and the biggest deals of the season. Shop 30 to 50% off Movement's innovative California clean watches, jewelry, and accessories with fast free shipping and returns now at MVMT.com. That's MVMT.com. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.